Master Sakyat Oko, the Shonrin Puchi. Homage to His Holiness the 16th Papa. And homage to Master. to the treatures of the altar. Homage to the main deity of the good practice today, Aishaya Guru Tathagata, the Medicine Buddha, and all the deities, all of his retinues, Dakinis, Tanjan Gatsu, all Dhamma masters, Dhamma educators, Dhamma teachers, Dhamma lecturers, Dhamma assistants, directors of temples and chapters, and all disciples present here over the internet. Our participating VIPs today are uh, Madam to Ambassador yeah. Daniel Liao, the Republic of China's rep to Norway and Sweden, Dhamma Sister Judy. The Academian from Academia Seneca, Professor Zhu Siyi. And Madam, accountant to Tubuda Foundation, Dhamma Sister Teresa, law advisor to Tubuda Foundation, the attorney Jennifer Zhou. Dr. Hang Zhou, Dr. Ryan Zong, producers for the Illuminating Your Program, Illuminating Your Heart Program, Dharma Sister Rebecca Shiachi. Australian Justice of Peace, Mr. Liang Ming Hao and his wife. Then my brother Gao Ming and his wife from California. Our advisor to Tubita Foundation, Ms. Huang Kim. Good evening, everyone. How do you do? Today, we had the group practice of Medicine Buddha or Paisaya Guru Tathagata. And today we have many people coming from faraway places and many countries. 
they all came here to the head temple, the Seattle Daytime Temple. And we have many more VIPs and also many disciples who did not introduce themselves. But it's, no matter what, I'm very pleased today to see all of you here. Especially today, we have extremely uh, many bodhisattvas descending. Many more, about three to four times more than the other times. So there are many prachna lights in the sky descending. Actually, this deity, the Vaisaya Guru Tathagata, he has many great vows with Grandmaster Sridham Amitabha Buddha's vows are the same, uh, similarly great. Like when we often chant upon seeing the Buddha, we transcend life and death. Like the Buddha, we liberate all. So, like a Buddha, you deliver all sentient beings. I know of one thing. It's like this. In the past, Vaisaya Guru Tathagata once, or oh, help me twice, the first time when in, when I lived in seclusion, my body was not well. My body felt like it was splitting and I called it um, the disease of splitting brain. Every time I looked down wearing the shoes, I felt like I was about to die. So I went circumambulating the Buddha. Like what I know about Buddhist countries like mainland China, it's the place where Chinese Buddhism flourished and Japan. Shikoku and Kyoto. There are many spiritual centers. They call temples spiritual centers. And like Kobudaishi, had 88 spiritual centers in Shikoku Island. So there were 88 temples just in Shikoku Island. And in Korea, I had never been to Korea then. And Korea is also a Buddhist country because Buddhism started from India to Southeast Asia and then to Tibet, to China, the Little Kingdom, to Korea and then to Japan. 
so I wanted to choose a place I had never been and to circumambulate the pagodas. So we went, I went to Korea and I felt really sick when I was circumambulating the pagoda. And eventually we got to the huge statue of Medicine Buddha. And in Korea, Tantric Buddhism is rather rare. And we have it in Japan, brought back by Kobo Daishi from Xi'an. Chinese Tantric Buddhism, which became Japanese Tantric Buddhism in Japan. And in Japan, there was also the Thai Tantric Buddhism, which was brought back by Zui Chen from the Mount Wu Thai, or actually Mount Tian Thai in China. So it's called the Thai Tantrayana and Japanese Tantrayana or Eastern Tantrayana in Japan, but not in Korea. In Korea, Zen Buddhism flourished, and over there there was the Chao Tong sect of the a sect of Zen Buddhism, and also the Lingji sect of Zen Buddhism. Both flourished in. Korea. So I went to that place. I paid homage to Medicine Buddha by Saya Guru Tathagata. And on the way back, after that, I truly <coughs> had the vision of by Saya Guru Tathagata. Let me tell you how I had the vision. I closed my eyes, my eyes were not open. And then around my eyes, there are lots of uh, shining light. And it's not due to the eyes. It's round rays of light. It's very like fine, delicate rays of light, and I knew that I would see Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The way I see the appearance of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas always like this, like rays of lights around, and in the middle there would be a round white screen. Then I saw the Medicine Buddha and also what I chanted earlier, the Medicine King Bodhisattva, Supreme Medicine Bodhisattva, Sunlight Bodhisattva, Moonlight Bodhisattva, and the Twelve Medicine Generals. I saw them all. And they radiated light to bless me. And I thought I would certainly be cured from my sicknesses. And later on, sure enough, I recovered. My problem with the head or the brain was resolved. And the second time, it was also severe when my leg was swollen. Now, I forgot as an old person, was it my right leg or my left leg? Right. Because both legs are the same, so there's nothing special. Because the leg didn't leave any marks, so I forgot whether it's the right or the left leg.
in any case, one of my legs were, was swollen, really huge. And the doctor diagnosed it as the... Oh, uh, Uh, and the doctor Zheng was my primary physician. It's the cellulitis. That was the cellulitis. And Dr. Zheng was my primary doctor, but they're also doctors specialized in the kidney, heart. Uh, tumor and growth, and most importantly, the <laughs> I, f- I forgot infectious diseases department. There were like eight doctors diagnosing and treating me, and wanted to, to use the strongest antibiotics to cure. <laughs> and the antibiotic was called the tigocyte. Antibiotics in Japanese, what do you call it? I forgot. I rarely use that Japanese. They have to use the strongest. And someone utilize this problem with my leg went to Korea. That place in Korea called the Mount Bakong and prayed to the Baisaya Guru Tathagata. Someone prayed for me and afterwards my leg after being cured by the doctors it subsided gradually and finally I had covered <laughs> so Baisaya Guru Tathagata did appear to help me and I personally saw it I also personally saw the elder venerable Xu Yun, when my leg was swollen as big as it's impossible to compare this thick it was thoroughly infected by germs and then they used the tigocyte antibiotic on top of the blessings of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And as I laid in bed, I saw the Elder Venerable Shi Yun standing on the clouds. And he extended his hand through the clouds all the way to touch my head. Just imagine how long his arm was. He was standing on the clouds in the sky and his hand touched my head all the way from the clouds. I saw it very clearly. I had lots of spiritual responses and then eventually my leg got completely recovered. And when this person prayed to the Medicine Buddha, there were also miracles. 
and they paid homage. There was a bird that flew down and perched on the Medicine Buddha's hand. And after the homage was done, the bird flew away. So that happened. That kind of spiritual response happened. So I had been saved by Raisaya Guru Tathagata twice. twice. I hope there would not be the third time. Because that's how human life is. If there's once, twice, and then three times, and after the third time, then I would lose my life. So I am very grateful. And the group practice of Baisai Guru Tathagata today, the Tathagata and all of his retinues descended. And bless all of us. President Buddha had many vows. And his vows were all great, quite incredible. He had great, twelve great vows. And his retinue are numerous. And his twelve great vows are to illuminate everyone, to enlighten all sentient beings. So all the the lights of everybody will be extremely supreme. Second is to deliver sentient beings. So, to have sentient beings, to satisfy all needs of sentient beings, so that all wishes fulfilled, so he could bestow uh, upon sentient beings. The fourth is to enable all sentient beings to live peacefully in accordance with Mahayana. So every sentient being will practice uh, Mahayana, not just Hinayana, so not just self-liberation, but to save everybody. And to enable all sentient beings to uphold three collective precepts, so the great Brahma heaven. And what is this Brahma cultivation? Is the pure conduct, which is what we often say, the conduct of the four immeasurables. So, kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So these four conducts of the four immeasurables are considered a pure conduct, the Brahma conduct. So if someone asks you about the Brahman conduct, you should remember with the loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So you use loving kindness to treat people with great merits and you use compassion to uproot the suffering of sentient beings. 
you use joy and diligence, diligent joy to continually do it. That's joy. And equanimity is toward people you love or hate, people you like or dislike, whether they're uh, tangible human beings or intangible beings, humans and non-humans, you use the equal mind to deliver them toward people you like or you dislike or you really despite or hate. You still use to have, you still use this equal equality to save and deliver them. So this character, Se, which also means forsaking or equanimity, is extremely important. You treat every single, single sentient being with equality, and especially toward your enemies. So Buddhism also teaches this. So loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity. So toward people you despise, you cannot curse on them or harm them or hurt them. Ex definitely not. If you say something bad, then you create a speech karma. If you think of it in your mind, then you have created a mind karma. And then if you use your body to harm them, then you have created the bodily karma. Toward your enemies, you have to be economist and to treat them equally as everybody else. So I want to remind all disciples that you have to respect everybody. Why? I have told this joke. If you hate someone, you have been carrying the burden of the hatred, the karma of the hatred. That's why you have to love all sentient beings equally. Jesus also said, Jesus was a guru. We have enshrined a statue of Jesus there. He's also my guru. When I was a Christian, he had said, you have to love your enemies. And the Buddha is the same. And the medicine Buddha too. You have to perform the Brahman conduct, which is you have to be kind, compassionate, joyous, and economist. So you use kindness to treat people um, in good luck and compassion to people with bad luck. And then you, you do all this with joy and with equanimity you treat all sentient beings equally. This is the spirit of Buddhism. That's the Brahman Kandak. Six, to enable those in needs to become fulfilled. So the vow of medicine Buddha. He could help me. If my leg did not get better, it had to be amputated. The doctors was in the opinion if the antibiotics could not cure it in order to save my life, my leg would have to be amputated and then I would be handicapped. Then that would be a horrible thing. So medicine Buddha could protect those who are lacking to become complete. Seventh, 
to eradicate all sentient beings' illnesses and to give peace and joy and to attain the Supreme Buddha. Eighth, if you pray, you can transform females into males. You can let them uh, make the females give birth to sons. The x-rays check it was a girl, but because you prayed to Medicine Buddha, you give birth to a son. There was a Taiwan disciple that in the x-rays, it was all girls, oh, but she gave birth to a boy. So this kind of things happen. And tenth, to relieve sentient beings from disasters of Maras and uh, deviant believers, evil views, and to guide you toward the right path and to relieve sentient beings from the disasters of tyrants, robbers, and thieves. So, what is the accidents and calamities? One of them is car accidents. Earthquake that uh, kill you. Flood or in the ocean that you drown in water. You were burned to death by fire. Or the wind storms like in America the tornadoes. So the natural disasters like earth, quick car accidents can be avoided by practicing this deity. If you often chant his name and you are in yogic union with him, then you would be able to avoid this uh, disasters and accidents. Eleventh, or accidental death, to provide a food and drink to starving and thirsty beings, and to provide beautiful clothing to the poor. And Seventh is to eradicate all illnesses of sentient beings. This is extremely important, especially uh, in old age. In the past, when I was young, I said something uh, very um, uh, kind of arrogant, and I said in my 30s or in my 40s, I said that if you hear that I cough once, then I will give you $500. If you hear me sneeze once, then you can come to me and earn $1,000. I have said this on the Dharma throne, right? Yes. But now I would not. I don't dare to say that because my mom often reminded me, once you grow old, I told my mom, why do you walk so slowly? It was, I, I could climb the mountain really fast. I climbed the Rainbow Mountain and I've walked very far away and I turned around and my mom was still at the bottom around the corner. And I asked her, why didn't you come up fast? And when she 
got to my side, she said, "You will know when you reach my age. Now I know." And about there. So human beings should not say something so uh, hefty, so hardy. And with the protection of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and with the love of Golden Mother and the care of the Golden Mother, and I will not definitely suffer from any illness. But it turned out I did suffer twice from huge problem. But now. In Taiwanese years, I'm 75. Doesn't no matter whether it's Taiwanese years or the normal years, I've passed 73, right? And the ghost witch claim <coughs> that I would have died at 73, and she kept. Talking about it for many years. How many years, Junfei? How many years has had she talked about my death at seventy-three? About ten years. At least ten years. She didn't tell me, but that's a good thing. Because if she told me ten years ago that you would die at seventy-three, then I would start to worry from then. Every day I would be really forlorn. And she just told me this past two, three years that the witch. Have been talking that grandmaster would die at seventy-three. So today I would play the story me to her. She is definitely wrong. Every time when she predicted someone would die at a certain age, she was always wrong. And there are two people here right now. The father and mother of Zhang Zhe are here. And she also claim that Zhang Zhe's dad will die at fifty-nine. And how old are you now? Fifty-seven. <laughs> But Grandmaster Lu guaranteed that you would not die at that age. And she also predicted that Zhang Zhe would die at how old? Twenty-nine. Didn't she say twenty-five too? <laughs> you know, let me tell you, there was one year when Zhang Zhe did not dare to go out of his house when he was twenty-five. He never left his house at all. Why? Because the ghost witch told him that he would die at twenty-five. That he would suffer from calamities, so Zhang Zhe did not leave the house for one year. And then also predicted him to die at twenty-nine, and I guarantee you that he would not die. Yeah, 
you know, let me tell you how to counter that because uh, you would psychologically be influenced when someone told you that. I told them a, a method, a dharma, and by doing certain things, you would be able to avoid the calamity. Even if, if her calamity, I mean, her claim was right, but no, she was always wrong. You know, I didn't do anything. I didn't do any practice. I, I didn't die. I didn't die. But of course, not that I will not die. At the right time, I will die. Of course, it's okay. Because that's my destiny. Time is, has come then I would leave. Golden Mother has told me when I would leave. I know, but I'm not worried about that. Why? Because I just face it lightly. Whether you leave early or you leave later, Everybody has to go. You know, the, the Great Mother, I mean, the lady from California said that, hey, human life is like calling on the phone. If you don't hang up first, I don't hang up first. Of course, you don't want to die young, like at 59. When I was 59, I was extremely strong. Body was strong. Even until now, at 75, my body is still very strong. So, my body is still very strong and well at now, at 75, and she claimed that I would die at 73. And she also predicted someone from the Tang that they have lived for four to five years longer than her prediction. Those couple from the Yen Tang. You know, the ghost witch always love to tell people when they would die. And she threatened them and then to get money. Oh, then you have to ask me to do this for them and to do homa and that and that and then to give her money and then she got money this way. So isn't she despicable? But yet we still have to uh, be empathetic toward her, sympathetic toward her, to treat her equally and even love her. <laughs> <laughs> Who would be able to to do that, to stand that? But even when you cannot, you have to. And I have to pray to heavens and to Paisaya Guru Tathagata to protect her with good health and peace and ease in their body and mind to come back to the right path and to practice the authentic dharma. Just don't always do this kind of stuff. Because once you attain the right dharma, that would be incredible. If you can enter into the formless samadhi, if you can be at the equal state with Buddha, where the Buddha has appeared, that kind of power definitely can be done if you practice the right, authentic Dharma. Not only the everlasting life as said by Jesus, so everlasting life, and you can deliver sentient beings at will and with great self-mastery. It's great mastery. Wouldn't that be great? Your stuff is useless. I've said it last week. You are in heaven. 
and your money is in the bank. Your wife is at somebody else's chest, and your siblings are fighting for your inheritance. And the counsel, she just told me, that's the saddest thing. But I said, no, it's the happiest thing, because as long as you are already in heaven. Then you don't need to worry about anything else, whether it's money. So at that time, would you still the witch, the ghost witch? Are you still going after money? That means you have not repented. Please never ask for money from anybody, and don't scam for them. And if you walk the right path and cultivate spiritually. Diligently, then you would also have attainment. What time is it now? Almost ten. So today I will talk about the wisdom empowerment. On Monday, the pre-practice. The wisdom empowerment talked about here is between I and the empowerments to the souls. So it's not to the human beings. Grandmaster delivers sentient beings like this. Pay attention. I save or deliver sentient beings. The non-humans. What is non-human? Spirits or souls? It's not a human being. It's a ghost. How do we deliver them? Like, how do I deliver my father? My father took refuge in me, so my disciple too. But he never cultivated spiritually. He had this huge ignorance and delusion. What is the greatest ignorance of human beings? It's when a human being dies, everything is gone. There is not even soul, no karma, no good karma, bad karma, no soul. When When he dies, everything is gone. Nothing. That's the biggest ignorance, the most severe ignorance. A lot of people think like that. When I die, everything is gone. There is no soul, or next life, or reincarnation, or the six rebirth runs. None of those exist. So he had the strong belief. And he never cultivated spiritually, but he did take refuge in me. And through the lineage from the refuge initiation, I opened my heart, transformed it to become a lotus blossom, and I supplicated my father to enter from the apex to my central channel and to the lotus inside my heart. And my father's soul and I merged to become one. Then make myself to enter into the heart of my Yidam, to the Yidam's heart. And I leave my father inside the heart of my Yidams, and I return to the human world. That's how I Bardo delivered my father. That's how I Bardo delivered my father. I used this method to Bardo deliver him. So in Bardo, Deliverance of a soul. I open my own heart 
and I want to part to deliver you, you enter into my heart and the soul and I enter into the heart of the Yidam and then he stays there and then he would go to the pure land by staying inside the heart of the Yidam and I return I come back so I use this method for my family otherwise I invite the Yidam to guide them that's another method you about Milarepa when he delivered his mother he used this grandmaster's method when he was delivering his own mother called the white the Nangsha Karjan and then invited his mother to enter into his heart and by the power of the lineage of, from Marba they went to the pure land and to leave the mother at the pure land and then he came back himself now we talk about the wisdom empowerment Three, mindfulness, mindful towards the secretly appearing guru with innate wisdom. The pre-practice is the same. You have to be thinking of your own guru. You have to be mindful of your guru. And mindful towards the passenger's path, like his retinues. So the guru and the retinues of your wisdom that's retinues. And mindful towards the innate realization, amidst the naturally occurring mindfulness, one must think towards the passenger, the messenger path in one sitting. So at the moment of death, you need to think of the retinue. So guru, Yida and protector and the protector is the retinue of the Yida retinue of the Yida and the main practice the soul seeks after the five upholdings in the intermediate state and the seven fear that occurred simultaneously if fear, seven kinds of fear appeared, like if you hear some shoutings, like the howls of the winds of the tornadoes and earthquakes, huge earthquakes, huge water flooding, fire burning you, when the souls encountered this kind of phenomenon. by either this upholdings like chanting the mantra if you can chant the mantra chant the name of the root guru chant the name of the protector or the mantra of the protector or the mantra of your yidam they are all fine they all work or the bodhicitta which is white like pearl or when you become soul you can maintain the clear light radiance of your heart. Which is bodhicitta, that's white like pearls. And the same as the success of failure of confirming the innate great place. Other than this phenomena of the intermediate state, no other continuum can happen. What is the goal? The goal is to be reborn into the Buddha land or to the pure land. Or you attain Buddhahood yourself. That's your goal. 
So what is the attainment of the clear radiance? Is the clear radiance that you generate by chanting mantra. The start of the affinities of ardent importance. Remember your own affinity, the start of your own affinity. So, this is very important in the wisdom empowerment the success or failure of confirming the innate great bliss. This is the key in the wisdom empowerment. Dakini is the messenger. Let me tell you, I often ask one person, did you receive the sealant or the mark from the Dakini, the confirmation from the Dakini. If you receive this confirmation, then you would become the confirmation of the innate great bliss. Like if you want to tell Grandmaster a dream, and Grandmaster would know immediately that you have received the confirmation of the of the Dakin. There was someone from Australia, which is the son of Master Lian Yi which is the abbot of the San Yi Lezhang Temple. He's a doctor, and he had received the mark or con confirmation from the Dakini. So I told him, and you have to practice with great discipline, and after you have attainment, you would be able to widely deliver sentient beings. He just left a few days ago. There was a disciple who just received the confirmation from the Dakini. So if any of you has this, you have to remember this. From the moment of the confirmation of the Dakini, you have to always remember that, and you would be able to elevate your goal or to maintain the clear light radiance in your heart. And that's the confirmation of the Dakini is the start of the affinity. And this start of the affinity is of extreme importance. Please raise your hand if you have received the confirmation of the Dakini, if you dare, if you really, truly receive confirmation from a Dakini, and that Dakini in the sky entered into your body and give the So I know one of you has received this. You saw the Dakini descended from the sky and entered into you and then give you the confirmation and this sign of Dakini inside your body. Such a person exists. Someone raised. And at that time, you would look like the Dakini.
when you become a soul, you need to think of this. Then you would be able to <coughs> to rise and, and to generate clear light radiance. So this is the start of the affinity. The barking by the Dakini. Anybody else? You don't dare? I'm asking you. Right, you have received a confirmation from Taki. You speak English? Do you speak English? Do you want to say something? She had, she has received that confirmation. When I was in Taiwan, there was also someone who had received that. It was extremely wonderful. So at that time, so it is the same as the success or failure of confirming the innate great bliss. And the start of the affinity is of extreme importance. So if you can remember or think of that start of affinity, then you would be able to maintain that clear light radiance. So the sage that can retain or maintain their own clear light radiance is called the clear light sage. So as long as you can think of the moment of that confirmation, is that you're mindful towards the messenger path, which is the retinues, the dakini, the dakinis, who give you the confirmation or the like the elder venerable Si Yun extended hand to touch my head, or the twelve medicine generals, or the medicine Buddha, Amitabha Buddha. You need to 
of being mindful of this, then naturally your body will be filled with light. This is very important. But you should not be mindful of this. A man was playing mahjong, and his luck is really bad. And the wife called him on the cell phone, and his luck turned a lot better. When he got home late at night, the husband, the wife was angry and throwing things, throwing a tantrum, and said. Uh, you you uh, a bad luck and the woman said well you always say that the woman is bad luck but why do you still want to marry us well didn't you hear the idiom that uh, from the bad luck we get something fortunate Xiao Ming told his mom that uh, I'm the most powerful in class. Why did you say that? When they announced the result of the test, the doctor said that Xiaoming, only you dragged the whole class down. So he claimed that he had great power. Actually, his test score was really bad, so he dragged down the whole class. Looking for a spouse is like looking for a toilet. When you enter into a public washroom, when you open the door, you, it's very dirty and there are some poo or some clean. So you went to the second. And there's no toilet inside. I mean, toilet paper inside. And then you walk to the third room. It's not a toilet. It's like a utility room. When you want to go back and get to the first and second run, there are people inside. So you cannot find your spouse. So don't be so picky. It's okay even one with poo or the one without toilet paper. It's okay too. What should you do without toilet paper? But it's okay. So don't uh, complain that they don't have this and that, or someone's this and that. The teacher asked Xiaomi, why did you cheat during exam? And Xiaomi scratching his head and said, then when should I cheat then if it's not during exams? The teacher said, get out of here. From the palm, you can tell the personality of your girlfriend. If the, the palm lines often appear on your cheeks, that means it's extremely violent.
Zen master seated on his Zen cushion for hours a day, sitting upright for four hours. And someone asked him, what's the secret to be able to do that? And the Zen master replied, the former two hours, I was training my own mind to cleanse away the dust of the world. And how about the latter two hours? After sitting two hours, my legs were numb, so I could not stand up. No matter what, according to the instruction of my gurus, we have to meditate every day. For spiritual <coughs> cultivators, we have to learn to enter into samadhi. We have to meditate. But during meditation, in the beginning, your legs will hurt, and you need to adjust your posture, which part is sore and numb. You have to adjust until you find the most suitable position that you don't feel any more soreness or numbness. So if your legs are sore or numb or painful, then it's impossible for you to enter into samadhi. You have to make sure that your legs are not sore, numb, or painful. You have to find the right position for yourself. Then that was the first a condition to enter into Samadhi, the foundation. We were talking about Zen Masters. You cannot sit for two hours that you cannot stand up anymore. This is important. That's all for today.